because now it's time for cutting the cord, Amy. Whoa. Cutting the cord. Woo. Yeah. Woo. Clap it up. You know, like every Oscar host, like three hours into the show, always says, well, we're halfway through the show now. <laughs> I feel like we're sort of at that moment. Well, it's bi-weekly. That's the problem now. So, we um... Pat it for all it's worth. Well, and are, then you saying that they, are you saying that it's a bi-weekly? We now need to be like two hours. Well, yeah. Well, you know what? We gotta pad that. the show. We, we wouldn't have done Cars 4 if we had a show next week. Cars, or even Cars 2. Cars but then again, we all put hit the promise Whatever. that we have to make extra time for Colin Hanks! Oh! He oh! is to talk about his documentary! Yeah! Woo. I won't tell you what it is. I want him to tell you what it is. It's very exciting. Uh, so here's the thing, Amy. Cutting yep. the cord, instant gratification. Now, nowadays, these kids, they love the streaming. They do. They do. And so we want to recommend films on Netflix, Crackle, Hulu Plus that people can stream. So yeah. the way it works is I will recommend a film, talk a little bit about it, get yeah. your thoughts on it. You'll recommend a film, talk a little bit about it, get my thoughts on it. We'll go back and forth All right, a couple let's do times. It. Let's until go. So you've got like four movies that it's you go can time. actually read. It's go. Yeah. It's go time. It's go time. Uh, my first film is uh, The Cook, The Thief, The Wife, and Her Lover from 1989. This is a film that, uh, as Elaine had said, who said? Me. You Probably said, Elaine. huh? Probably Elaine. Probably Elaine <laughs> said, uh, just recently was available at all on these uh, services. And she is so right. And The Cook, The Thief, uh, The Wife, and Her Lover is a film unlike anything you have ever seen. It was directed by Peter Greenaway, uh, who is just a wild director. And as a wild director, this is his wildest film. And it is, it is gaudy and bold and colorful and angry and violent and absolutely brilliant. This, is, this movie is like nothing you have ever seen. Uh, in the movie, Michael Gambon plays a gangster, probably the most disgusting, vile, loud, obnoxious, violent person ever committed to film. That is how horrible he is. And he owns this restaurant. And in the restaurant every night, he eats a big banquet with his posse that includes his poor put-upon wife, played by Helen Mirren. And Helen Mirren hates this guy because he's such a horrible, obnoxious gorilla that one day, while eating, this, eating in this restaurant, Helen Mirren spies a bookish guy Kind of a guy, he's eating by himself, reading a book, minding his own business, very quiet. And the two of them wind up having an affair at the restaurant. They sleep together in the kitchen, in the bathroom, in the meat locker, all under the nose of this horrible gangster. So the whole time, you're wondering, when will they be found out? What will the gangster do? And what winds up happening is stuff that you cannot not imagine. This movie will hook you from the first second. Some people thought... It was a knock on Margaret Thatcher. I don't know that I buy that. I mean, maybe if I lived there, I would. You know, I just think it's really more a function of you get this guy who, you know, this, this elite guy who's very obnoxious and the smart guy, you know, the bookish guy who winds up being sort of the trot upon characters. I think it's really more of a class issue thing than really more of a Margaret Thatcher, uh, Margaret Thatcher political thing. But either way, The Cook, The Thief, The Wife, and Her Lover is just brilliant. It is like nothing you've ever seen. Uh, you've seen it, right? I've never seen it. I've only seen the sequel. I'll tell you, it's on, um, it's on Netflix. And when it first came out, the MPAA gave it an X. And this was, this is one of the films that actually prompted the creation of the NC-17 rating. So you're right there at that cusp. So the MPAA gave it an X, and then Miramax decided to release it unrated. Now, what Netflix has done, which is great, and Hulu Plus also, is they've actually given you the full two-hour and, like, four-minute cut. Because there is a 98-minute cut out there, which you do not want to see. And luckily, Netflix and Hulu Plus, they've given you the longer cut. And I cannot recommend this film highly enough. I think it's a great film. The Cook, the Thief, the Wife, and Her Lover. Right, Amy? Way to go. So that is my first recommendation. Amy, what is your recommendation? My first recommendation is my favorite film, which is streaming on Amazon right now. And it is called Pennies from Heaven. It's the very second film that Steve Martin ever did. He came out, he did The Jerk, and then he had the muscle to do whatever film he wanted to do next. So he did this really interesting musical based on a British miniseries that used to star Bob Hoskins called Pennies from Heaven. And in the American version, it's a... It's a musical about a, a traveling song salesman who lives in Chicago who's got a terrible territory. And he loves the old classic songs of the, of the 30s, like Life is Just a Bowl of Cherries. And he really wants his life to mimic the magic that he hears in the songs where everything's perfect, nobody's sick and dying, 
there's no depression going on and his wife is not refusing to sleep with him as his wife is in this film. So he's all about trying to capture this magic and he comes across Bernadette Peters who's this really pure little demure uh, mouse who lives in this house with her, her brothers and her father. And they fall in love but he's married and he's also a complete cad and jerk and then there's musical numbers on top of that. And it's the most depressing but hilarious film I have ever seen and this is the film that if I ever wrote a book, it would be a book about this. Because I think you could write 10 pages on every second of this film. It's fantastic. And if you haven't seen it, to me this is Steve Martin's better, best performance he's ever given. I know that there are people out there who would say Cheaper by the Dozen, but this is going to top it. <laughs> Nothing can top Cheaper by the Dozen. Nothing. Have you seen, fighting words. Have you seen Pennies from Heaven? Pennies from Heaven, I like a lot. It's a, very, it's a really interesting film. You know, at the time it came out, it was... Super controversial. Mm. It was considered a bomb because way back then it cost, hold on to your hats, this is a big budget film. It cost $22 million. Oh, yeah. It's part of why wow. they say musicals died. Well, you know, the thing with the movie that I think might have turned people off, although it was a, such a bold choice, is that, that the scenes that took place in real life were very depressing. I mean, Steve Martin's going to like get hung in this film. You know, he's, he's, yeah. he's on trial for a, for a crime and whatever. So the actual real life scenes are really, really dark and depressing. Yeah. They do not skimp on that. They don't and hold then, back at all. Because, that, because in contrast to that, you have these musical numbers, which are great. And you've got, you've got the Busby Berkeley style choreography. Mm -hmm. You've got these great songs by, you know, like Fred Astaire, Bing Crosby. Uh -huh. And Fred Astaire... You've got costumes by Bob Mackie, who used to dress Cher. That's right. Ooh. And, you know, Fred... <laughs> and by the way, you know, Fred Astaire, who famously hated the movie, mm -hmm. because I think, like, he was still in Jealous? that... Jealous? Well, I, I, I think he was still in that, that thing where, like, you know, way back when, it was, like, rose-colored glasses, yeah. halo effect, that whole thing. <laughs> Um, but still, it's very dark, and th the whole idea of the film being how uh, real life is pain, but the movies are real, and that's where your happiness comes. I love that theme. It's true, and if people aren't sold yet, you've also got Christopher Walken as a pimp who has a huge heart tattoo, and it's one of his first dance numbers. And, um, and I might also say that... Uh, if you've ever seen Dancer in the Dark, the really depressing Lars von Trier one, once you see Pennies from Heaven, you realize everything that worked about this, he stole. Whoa, look at that. Whoa. Lars von Trier, the Nazi. I know. That's all another story, folks. Chad will talk about that next show. Oh, and the last thing, Steve Martin learned how to tap dance just for this movie. So if you respect good old-fashioned Hollywood craft work, this is it. There it is. Pennies from Heaven from 1980. Uh, from 1980. 80. Flat up 80. Woo. Nominated for three Oscars. Nominated for three. It was a bomb. Still nominated for three Oscars. Uh, so it's a great recommendation, Pennies from Heaven. Uh, my second and final recommendation for this week is the 1981 drama Absence of Malice. Now this is available on Crackle, and uh, Sally Field plays a uh, Miami newspaper reporter who implicates an innocent man, played by Paul Newman, in the in the death of a labor leader. Uh, labor leader, and of course Newman has the bad luck to be uh, his relatives are in the mafia, so there is a. There is some question there as to whether or not he really did it, but really he's innocent. And Sally Field and Paul Newman sort of team up to sort of prove his innocence. And the movie, it's funny because a lot of critics who, talk, who talked about this film back in 81, they really bumped against it because what Sally Field does in this film as a newspaper reporter, she's very overeager, she wants to win a Pulitzer Prize. What she does is so unethical in this film. But the funny thing is that if you watch it in 2011, the unethical thing she did as a newspaper person, now it's like, meh. Make up stuff, meh, who cares? They do it all the time now. You know, steal stuff from other sources, meh, doesn't matter. But back then in 1981, a lot of the critics who talked about the film, they were like, you would never, she would never do that. But you know what, it's a drama, so it doesn't matter. Uh, the film was directed by Sidney Pollack, the late Sidney Pollack, and he was so terrific. And you know, if you know Pollack's work, it's just very clean and crisp and just good storytelling. There's a great vengeance plot involved as Paul Newman kind of tries to set things straight. Uh, very good performances. It, it feels like it was written by a real newspaper man, which of course it was written by a real newspaper man, a former Pulitzer Prize winner. And uh, I just think the film is terrific. It's a nice little gem. It's a little bit like, it's on par with the film that I had recommended a few weeks ago called End Justice for All, where it's sort of that really solid mid-level kind of, you know, courtroomy kind of uh, newspapery thing. So I like Absence of Malice a lot. It's available on Crackle from 1981. I don't know if you remember that film. I was two. <laughs> I was 27.
Nobody's laughing. That means people are like, like, wow, that might be true. It's not true, folks. God damn it. Do I look that old? You look great. You do. You're well preserved. I hate everybody. It's not fair. Somebody else interview Colin Hanks. It's unbelievable. Okay, so uh, Absence of Malice, that's my next uh, recommendation. Now, Amy, you, you have one. I'm doing two musicals this week. And my other musical is Step Up 3, which you might have seen in theaters if you saw it as Step Up 3D, which was kind of fantastic. Um, I'm not going to lie to you, Step Up 3 is what you might call a terrible movie. Like, the characters are awful, and the dialogue is just horrific. The plot is a plot you've seen 50 times, and nothing new happens. Everything happens exactly how you might think it is. But the dancing is so fantastic. This film is directed by John Chu, who did the Justin Bieber documentary the other day, which, when I was on the plane uh, a month ago, every man I saw on the plane was actually watching either that documentary or The Eagle. It was really weird. Justin Bieber sort of strangely popular. But I think that speaks to the power of Justin Chu, or not Justin Chu, John Chu, who is going to be di um, directing the G.I. Joe sequel in a second. Oh, thank God there's a G.I. Joe sequel. I know. But My <laughs> prayers are answered. The thing is, this guy is a really young talent, and he's fantastic. The guy knows how to take a body and move it in directions that look interesting. So does my masseuse, but he's not going to direct a film. Well, no, but if there were 10 Mark Kaisers being moved in, in synchronicity by Corey, by the way, Corey, hang on. Then this would be fantastic. I thought that joke was okay. It wasn't great. It wasn't a home run. It was a double. Corey? Did no, no, nobody guy. laughed. Is that what you're saying? I don't Maybe think I anybody do. laughed. Did any person laugh at that? Uh, no, not really. No, I'm right, sorry. Keep talking about Step Up. I'm sorry. But the dancing in Step Up is beyond belief. And if you want, it's on Netflix Instant, and you can actually fast forward all the talking and only watch the 10 dance numbers, which I did last weekend, and it's fantastic. And imagine it in 3D and, you know, sort of close your eyes or cross them a little bit. And you can see that you might actually want to see G.I. Joe 2 only because John Chu is fantastic. Okay, here's the thing. And then we have to move on to parental guidance. First of all, that movie sucks. Um, and the second Did thing Did you is, even see it? The F no. I'm not going to see that. All right, all right, although all right. Say, although I'll say this. Is there a dance, is there a dance uh, number in Washington Square Park? I don't know Washington Square in, Park. In, in, in New York. There in, is this in, dance number that I think you might actually like that's kind of borrowed from Singing in the Rain. It's like a straight shot. It's just a one-take dance number, and it's like two and a half minutes, and they swing on light poles, they jump on trash bags. This is all happening on the streets of New York. It's, it's, oh, it's you, well, because I saw them shooting that. Oh, is that true? Well, because I is was walking through Washington Square, and, and they're shooting something, and I said, oh, what's that, what, what's that show? He so, says, oh, it's Step Up 3. You've sort of seen Step Up 3. I, all I want to see of it. That's As it, it turns out. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. Okay. So uh, to wrap up the uh, Cutting the Core, we have uh, The Cook, The Thief, The Wife, and Her Lover. By the way, that's one film, not four. Uh, Pennies from Heaven. That was funny. I, ha I hate all of you. Good. Crew's fired. Uh, whoa! It's fighting words. Absence of Malice and Step Up 3D for Cutting the Core. Yeah, you know it. All right, now... As we enter the sixth hour of the show, we have uh, Philip Nelson is here with parental guidance. Let's do it. Good switching on the TriCaster. Look at that. TriCaster Emily, good job. Philip. TriCaster Emily. Hey guys, how's it going? It's going fantastic. Now, um, I always make fun of Philip Nelson because every time he recommends a film. I'm just, I'm just, I always like it. And I'm thinking maybe this will be, will this be the week where I don't like a film he recommends? Because every well, one he recommends is like, it's a good, good film. Let's see what he recommends. Yeah. So Probably what do you got? Something amazing. Wow, what is it, Philip Nelson? This movie was actually requested by my seven-year-old daughter, and I dreaded watching it with her, and was surprised when I liked it. And it's Free Willy 4. Escape. Oh, wow. So much for Philip picking the best movies ever. I know. But here's the question. Has any of you have either seen it? No. Why would we? I mean, no, we haven't seen Free Willy. You love animals. I, I think, you know, I think I, Mark's, I, so, Mark's in so much shock, he won't even talk. I actually saw that with a, a double feature with Step Up 3D. <laughs> so uh, well, tell us about the film. So this movie, it stars actually uh, Bindi Irwin, which is Steve Irwin's daughter from Crocodile Hunter. And, uh, and also Bo Bridges. And when I saw that Bo Bridges was in it, you know, I was like, hey, you know, he's a good actor, so I don't know much of it. He plays the white You know what, my, my, my kids, the, I'm being attacked by Biebers behind me. Um, we're going to a midnight showing of Green Lantern, and they're getting restless, so that, that's who's walking Hurry behind. Hurry this up. Sorry about that. So, uh, 
anyway, um, so the movie is basically uh, Bendy Irwin. Um, it's her first big movie with Bo Bridges. And it's about a little girl who goes to stay with her grandfather for the summer, and he has this rundown amusement park that's a seaside amusement park, and a wave washes in a baby orca into their, their little lagoon. And the grandfather kind of uses this orca um, as a way to revitalize his business. And it, it is a silly little story, but it actually, was, I thought it was very good. So, uh, you know, I had to, you know, one of the things I try to do with parental guidance is, uh, you know, these aren't, I, I try to not pick kids' movies, uh, movies that you would put on and let a kid watch while you go do laundry or something. It's actually a movie that you enjoy as a family to watch together. And so I wanted to share this one because I, I, I would bet that very, very few people have seen it because it never went, made it to the theater. It was straight to video, and uh, I actually watched it on Netflix. Um, but, you know, in, in the parental guidance segment, we rank the movies in different areas that are important to families, and, and every parent has a different hot button. Um, so instead of saying, go see this movie, I just kind of give you the, uh, the rankings, and then you can pick if your hot button is hit. And, uh, and those areas are action, language, romance, peril, and family enjoyment. So let's go ahead and jump into my rankings. In the action category, I'm going to give it a three on a scale from one to five. It's right there in the middle. You know, there's some kid-friendly action where the guy that has the big amusement park is trying to to poison the the, the whale so that it hurts his competition. Um, but it's it's not really an action movie. In the language category, I'm going to give it the lowest ranking possible, which is a one. Um, because I, there was no bad language in here. It's 100% family appropriate in that area. Also in the romance category, I'm going to give it a one, which is very low, because, you know, it's just a sweet little family movie. In the peril section, in the peril category, I'm going to give it a two. Um, really the only peril is, is when uh, the uh, guys, please quit walking behind me, or you're going to, I'm not taking you to Green Lantern. Um, so, tough crowd. I know. I have to draw the line somewhere. Um, and it, it, but in the peril category, uh, it, you know, it's a two um, because the, the bad guy is trying to, to hurt the whale, you know, and, and uh, it might bother some kids a little bit. And also the fact that the, the baby orca is separated from its family, you know, and it can, might be a little scary to some kids, but not really. And then in the family enjoyment um, re uh, category, I'm going to give it a three. I put it right there in the middle. It's not like every family is going to love this movie. But it was one of those movies where I expected it to be so horribly bad that I was pleasantly surprised. I mean, anything that makes it to four, it, it's, it gets scary, you know. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I liked the first Free Willy. I didn't like the second, the second and third very much. They thought they were okay. But I was surprised by Free Willy 4, Escape from Pirate Cove. <laughs> Are you talking me, Mark? They're laughing. I don't know why, why are people laughing. <laughs> one was good. Two or three, not so much, but four. But four, four, four. four. Now and back in. Imagine if he, was doing the, if he was doing the Friday the 13th films. This is the longest review. Eight. Friday the 13th, eight. Heard. That's my pick. <laughs> in fact, this is the only review. Of the <laughs> Jason versus Freddy. That's going to be next week's parental guidance. Oh, my God. Oh, my but, God. You know, All right, so there you go. So eight. free will. Huh? What happened? What did I do? Okay, All so. All I was going to say is it's free on Netflix. <laughs> Give it a look. If you hate it after 10 minutes, you know, turn it off. You know, you've lost nothing. But <laughs> so, so what you're saying is, what you're saying is we provide a service to make sure that the viewers don't waste their time when you're telling them, eh, feel free to waste your time if you want. You know, I have to say, my seven-year-old loves this movie. All right, she there you go. You've got a seven-year-old. Three by four. Three by four. Enjoy Green Lantern. Yeah, Philip Nelson. Go take your kids See to you the midnight later. movie. All right, so uh, uh, Colin Hanks says uh, he's, he's, he's already taken a nap and a shower and changed his clothes <laughs> and uh, because he's been here for so long, waiting to do Stupid for Movies. Now, here's the thing. Colin's about to come on. Now, he's got this documentary he wants to do. He's, uh, he's doing the whole crowdsourcing thing, and it's a great way to get your documentary done, and we want to have, we want to have him on right now, talk about crowdsourcing, talk about the documentary, and let's take a look at the project right now. Here we go. Hi, I'm Colin Hanks. A couple of years ago, my partners and I had an idea to make a documentary film about a man named Russ Solomon. Now, you might not recognize the name, but chances are you bought music from him. Russ is responsible for one of the most beloved companies in the history of the music business, Tower Records. 
In a story that spans over 50 years, Tower Records grew from one small brick and mortar record store to a global retailer selling records, videos, and books from Sacramento to New York, from London to Tokyo. Somewhere in this long history, Russ Solomon's store became much more than just a place to buy records. It grew into an institution. It seems everyone has their own story and a personal connection to what Tower Records meant to them. Now, to some, it represents the first casualty of the so-called death of the music industry. But to most people, it was a home for music. It was theirs. It didn't matter what kind of music you liked. There would be someone at Tower who could help you find what you were looking for and probably turn you on to something new. As we started down this road, we realized that this story is bigger than just Tower Records. With the introduction of Napster, Amazon, and iTunes as Tower Records closed its doors, the collapse of Russ Solomon's dream became an example of a cultural shift, not only in the music industry, but in the way that people interacted with each other. On our first trip in 2008 to visit with Russ, I decided to drive by one of the old Tower Records stores. The neon sign was still on the storefront. Racks were still in the aisles. Headphones, telephones, and cash registers all still there. The only thing that had changed was that the store was completely empty. No customers, no workers, and no records. We threw together what we could as quickly as we could, documenting the store exactly as we found it. We also began the first of what we hoped to be many interviews with Russ, as well as the people on whom he relied to make Tower Records into a global brand. But we've only skimmed the surface. For this project, there's much more research that needs to be done, documents and pictures that need to be archived and digitized, and of course, many more interviews to be filmed. Which brings us to the question, what are we doing here on Kickstarter? Well, we thought that we could use the tools of this new era to help celebrate the old one. We feel that there's no one better suited to help bring this documentary to life than the people that loved and cared for the company the most. If you worked at a Tower Records, if you shopped at a Tower Records, or if you're just a fan of music history, we hope that you will help us with a contribution so that we can finish our documentary of this incredible company and the end of an era in music history. Colin Hanks, everybody, come on! <laughs> now, now, Colin, before we talk, I have an announcement. I, wa I want you to know something. I just read that they greenlit Free Willy Five. <laughs> now, oh my God, that's so great because I'm all caught up on what happened in Number Four <laughs> <laughs> with all the scary meters, with the Orca family separating the thing and the. The bad guy's coming, and there's not a lot of foul language, which is great. I really hope they stick with that. I'm hoping Lori Petty makes a comeback. That's a reference to the first Free Willy. I don't think Michael Madsen's going to be in part five, though, kids. Ask your parents who Michael Madsen is. I'm sure they'll be able to tell you. Oh, my God, that's funny. So, so I've never had to follow a review for a free movie online <laughs> that is the fourth in a series of movies about a, an orca whale. <laughs> so are you saying the bar for entertainment is now set so low? Stupid for movies, stupid, stupid movie! Oh yeah, change the name, everyone change the graphic. Corey, get on that, change the graphic. All right, first of all, thank you so much for being My here. My pleasure, thank you for having me, I really appreciate Streaming it. Streaming Garage. You know, but before the show, uh, I was mentioning that you were in a film that I thought was just a terrific little gem called The Great Buck Howard. Yes. Now, Thank you very much. Now, The Great Buck Howard, I mean, you know, that was with John Malkovich. Yes. 
who plays this illusionist, this kind of a magician-y guy, mm -hmm. and he, he's, com he's completely sold on his own fame and his own level of... Uh, yeah, he's sort of a, a raging egomaniac. Yes. In, uh, in a show business -y kind of vain way, yeah. And, you know, when you... This, this is going to sound so talk showy thing to ask you, but I just have to. John Malkovich is so good that when it's like, when you're working with a guy, named, a guy like John Malkovich, are you like, are you just kind of thinking he's going to go to weird places and you just kind of have to go with it? Or is he... I, ne I never broke up more during a job than on that, on, on that job. I mean, I was constantly breaking character and laughing and ruining takes because like, uh, I think the thing with, with Malkovich is, is that he's so used to having to just sort of play this one kind of guy because everyone sort of pins him as an insane guy. And what people don't know is he actually is incredibly funny and enjoys making people laugh. And even when he's doing his quote-unquote scary movies, he's still just trying to make people laugh. Um, the best example I have there was, I mean, we would constantly, he would constantly throw out stuff and he improved a large chunk of like little one-liners and stuff in the movie. But there was one night where um, uh, uh, the whole crew was around and there was a TV that was playing uh, in the line of fire. And everyone's watching it because it's like, it's John Malkovich, you know, it's, it's a good movie. It's Clint Eastwood. So we're watching it and John's sitting there and he's sort of like, he's watching himself in a movie, which is kind of cool. And you know that part where um, uh, uh, like uh, Clint Eastwood is chasing Malkovich and Clint Eastwood jumps across a building and he doesn't make it and Malkovich sort of holds his hand and, 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 and uh, Eastwood puts a gun out and then Malkovich puts his mouth on the gun. He did that to make Eastwood laugh. And Eastwood thought it was hilarious. And it was just like a joke. And that was it. It was just a joke. And of course, that's like one of the creepiest parts of the movie. You right, know? Right. So like, he's got this really sort of funny joker mentality. And he's also uh, fully aware that um, he can come off really scary to other people. And even like when he yells at people, like he will like yell like, it's really hot in here. Can we get some AC? And then two seconds later, he's going, I could be such a dick. <laughs> and, it's, and, and it's sort of like amusing to him. He's a, he's a sweetheart of a man and, and uh, I would work with him in a heartbeat. And he really made that movie. I mean, he was, he was far and above what we were, uh, what we were expecting. Well, it's sort of when, when you do a film and you've done a number of films and TV shows, like The Good Guys, which I really like, do you find that like in terms of the attitude on the set, the atmosphere, is it kind of top down? Like if the star of the film or if the oh, director's yeah. a jerk or something and kind of makes everybody edgy? Oh yeah, most definitely. Mo I mean, if, without a doubt. Because, um, I mean, that's, it's not ne like necessarily the golden rule that's set in stone, you know? I mean, sometimes you can have a blast on a movie that could be a great experience and it just doesn't turn out that good. Um, so you never really sort of know. And I'm, I'm actually sort of convinced that any movie that is remotely good, they, you don't know if it's really good or not. You're surprised by it. Because the ones that you think, oh, this is gonna be really good, those are the ones that end up being really unwatchable. <laughs> um, and so the ones where you have, a, if, if you have a good time that can sort of be a clue as to whether it's gonna be pretty good. But, you know, ultimately, you also just sort of, a lot of people judge the movie by how well it does. And so like Buck Howard is one of these movies that sort of continues to live on in its sort of like post-released life, you know, and it's one of those things where it's like people, people, it's like you, people say like, oh, you know, that's actually a really, really good movie. And I like that. I like when, when it still sort of, it, when it still sort of has a, has a life. Now, I mentioned The Good Guys, and uh, I like that show, you know. Now here you're doing, Thank you. you know, I felt like either Fox didn't give it enough time, or maybe they felt like, because it was sort of this throwbacky thing that maybe people didn't get it? I think it was a combination of a bunch of different things. I think it was a combination of uh, the show, uh, as all shows do, really needed some time to find its footing. And we, I think by the end of the first season, we had really started to, to, to get in the mode of, of, of what the show really was. 
Um, but unfortunately, at, at that stage, there were all of these other factors that had sort of come into play. The, the, a lot of this stuff with the good guys was, was really strange. The show, we didn't do the normal sort of pilot scenario. It was picked up straight to series, so it was straight 12 episodes right away, um, which was great. But then we were airing in the summer, but before we had premiered in the summer, we had already been picked up for fall, which was great. But they announced us on Fridays in the fall, but we hadn't premiered on... Mondays and the it got really sort of convoluted and people had a hard time sort of finding it and then that combined with the natural sort of evolution of the show itself eventually we we got it but it, you know it's one of those scenarios where it's unfortunate the way that it, that it came out but at um, first like you know your your agent calls you and they're like you know Colin weekly paycheck oh family no I right? was like a weekly paycheck yeah. <laughs> that was like great, great fabulous right? yeah oh yeah I mean 12 12 12 uh, 12 episodes right away yeah fabulous done but it helped you know I mean Matt Nix is a very funny uh, a very funny guy and, a, and a, an extremely funny writer and and uh, and uh, Brad Whitford is one of the uh, I mean that guy's hilarious um, he actually left a two-minute uh, voice message on my phone yesterday that is him reading a monologue from uh, Henry V, really <laughs> sort of lamely, and then saying that if I don't call him back, he's going to resort to the Eugene O'Neill, and so I just have to learn to respect his acting. Like, he's just a weird guy like that. He's a funny guy like that. So, I don't know. Good guys, I, I, I have a, a fondness for that show, and, and that's, uh, you know, in this day and age of, uh, well, dudes reviewing Free Willy 4, yeah. uh, <laughs> these things have li uh, lives forever. They live on forever. But then how does it, and then we'll get on to the documentary, but I, I just have to know, like, how does a show get canceled? Like, do they, does somebody call you and say, dude, it's over? No. No, no, no. Do you already read in the trades? Do they pay you, do they pay out the rest of your season? The, the irony with the good guys was is that they never, <laughs> they didn't want to make the announcement. Um, which in one way is sort of like a slap in the face, but then the other way is kind of nice of them. They don't want to make the announcement that they're canceling the show so that it doesn't seem like the show is a failure. They want, it, they want to just be able to say, oh, the good guys, you know, months later, oh, yeah, that's not coming back, and just sort of let it disappear. It's always so you found out because you, you read it on uh, Just Jared or something like that. Uh, I had a feeling that it was coming. I mean, we all sort of knew that it was going to probably be coming at some point, but it took some, yeah, it, it ended up being some weird thing where some film commission site from Dallas mentioned it, and then another Dallas site mentioned it because the show shot in Dallas. It took place in Dallas. And then next thing I know, everyone on Twitter is saying, like, so sorry, you just lost your job. I, I just can't believe there's no like high-level phone call. Like, you know, yeah. somebody calls you and says, uh, "Not, not hey, for it's the Colin actors." Hanks, let's, let, let's have the courtesy of giving him a phone call. Not for the actors. I mean, because if they were making a movie about it, then you would have had a moment. You know, when you got the news to do something ceremonial or like have a glass of whiskey, or the cast would get together and like shoot paintball guns. Like, what did you guys do? We rap party, big huge. Yeah, yeah we uh, we just had a yeah. big huge rap party. Cocaine, everything. Yeah. Be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Mark's trying to live vicariously. So. Listen, when you're up all night watching F Free Willy 4, <laughs> you gotta do whatever, whatever gets you through the night. As Lennon said. It's all right. Yes, it's exactly. all right. All right, so now, forget the Buck Howard, forget the good guys, right? It's in the forget past. acting. Beloved, in the past. You got this documentary. Yes. First, I want to talk about what the documentary is, because that's, to me, unbelievably fascinating. And then also, how you're financing the documentary, which is so forward-thinking and equally mm -hmm. fascinating. It's First different. of all, tell us about the documentary, this passion project that you have. Uh, me and some partners who I grew up with in Sacramento, where I was born and raised, um, we uh, are making a documentary about the rise and fall of Tower Records. Uh, Tower Records was the global music retailer from around the world. Probably everyone here in this room at some point bought a record or a tape or a CD, whatever, an album from Tower Records. And um, it's basically charting the history of the company. Um, we are, as, a, uh, as someone that was from Sacramento, uh, Tower Records was originated from Sacramento. And it has uh, a really sort of tremendous history in terms of its point A to point B. And uh, being a native Sacramentan, 
it was always a great point of pride that the uh, company that big was from our hometown. And so uh, initially what we wanted to do was just sort of, it seemed like an interesting story for a documentary. It seemed like a, a, a ripe documentary tale. A guy starts selling records out of his father's drugstore in the 40s and it turns into the biggest music retailer in the world and it totally helps revolutionize the way the music retail industry functioned. Um, and so that's really sort of the documentary and, and we've, we've uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, started our conversations with Russ Solomon who is the founder and, and talked with a bunch of different uh, people that he considers really vital to the company. And we're, we're trying to make this documentary about this uh, company that um, not only the people that worked for uh, had a, has a great fondness for, but pretty much anyone who's a music fan also has sort of great fondness for it because the tower really was a, a, a special place of its era and that era is 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 no longer but when when you say that tower records revolutionized the way records were <coughs> sold how does that in in the sense that when russ started selling records the idea of a record store did not exist music was sold primarily in department stores Woolworths, supermarkets, that's where you would buy your 78s or your 45s, so back when it's all just, just proper uh, you know, records. Um, and Russ started selling used 45s out of his father's drugstore, and that was pretty much how music was sold. And as uh, things progressed and as he, as he opened up an actual storefront, and the store sold nothing but records, um, that was sort of, you know, I don't, don't want to say that he created the record store because he didn't. There were a lot, of, a lot of different record stores, a lot of different chains from, you know, around the world. But uh, Tower was one of the sort of uh, 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 forerunners, if you will, that created sort of tenets of selling music that, that became the norm. The idea of if you've got a big building, well, why don't you paint an album cover on the outside to advertise that you're selling that record? That had never been done before. That was something that Tower came up with. The idea of creating a, a, a magazine or a, a newsletter that was informing you of the albums that were going to be coming out that month, that had never been done before. Tower did it with Pulse magazine. The idea of creating a website that sold records that they would ship to your house had never been done before. Tower was the first one to do it. Tower had all of these, these, uh, these sort of happy accidents that they discovered being music fans and sort of learning how to do this on the fly that became the norm. And that combined with the um, sort of independent spirit that Tower had at its inception and pretty much Every store that came out, every store had their own art department. Every store had their own manager that ran the store their sort of way. It was a big chain, but each store had an individual feel. That was very different than, say, your Music Plus or your Warehouse or your Strawberry Records or Coconut Records or, or Sam Goodies or anything like that. I mean, it's funny because when, as you as you describe it, I'm almost sort of flashing on the Apple Store in this way. It's something that seems very utilitarian, you go in, you buy a record, you go in, you buy a computer, but it became this place where people would go to yeah. flip through and meet other people yeah. and listen to music and see what's out there. It became kind of a, it seems like it became kind of a communal little neighborhood of, uh, yeah. of music lovers who would come to this place. Most most definitely. I mean, it, it's all, some people sort of always laugh at the term, but it really was sort of like the salon of its, of its time, you know, I mean, I think you and me might, well, we might be the only three people that are understanding that term. <laughs> Salon. Yes, Why are you counting me out? Well, I know. Uh, well, I, because I'm a girl. No, 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 no. Just like that seems to be a term that I'm sorry. I it's mean right. to I'm insult with, you. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm but like the idea of it's a place where you can go and just talk. You know that that it's a social well, yeah, place. That's, I that's don't mean like a hair salon. Mm -hmm. obviously. Well, that's what record stores were. I mean, you would yeah. go in, and, and the big problem with record stores, you always go like, oh, I don't remember what I wanted, and you yeah. sit there for two hours and you discover something. Yeah. yeah. I but, mean, but the people that were knowledge, the sales were knowledge. Well, that that yeah, that but, that, yeah. that that was the big thing is that Tower created an atmosphere in which uh, you were you could be very comfortable, and the one of the ways that they did that is they 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 hired incredibly 
knowledgeable people right. that took great pride in their job. And so um, if you were looking for some obscure classical record, okay, there would be someone who worked in the classical department at a Tower Records that knew you know, as much as they could. It was their baby. That's what they did. So there was an attention to detail to music. It wasn't just, well, let's take the top 100 records that are selling, we'll have five of them, and we'll just sell records. That wasn't it. It was all about your inventory. You had to, you know, each tower had to have an amazing, extensive inventory that had every single kind of record you could possibly imagine. So if it had Miles Davis, it didn't just have Bitches Brew and Kind of Blue, it had all of, you know, all of his records, that kind of stuff. It was that attention to detail that the people that worked for the tower stores, the, the actual clerks had for their store that is very, very special and very different and, and, and was lost as the, 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 the company sort of was, was bought out and, and was having financial issues. And, and that's all stuff that we're gonna, we're gonna touch into the documentary as well. But it's this, this story that, you know, initially was just the history, but then what really sort of has, has, has really made me a, a man obsessed is, is the, the, the kind of people that were involved in this company, the, the, the belief and, and love they have for it. I think it's, uh, it needs a, a proper send-off, because I didn't think it really got it. Well, what, what I think is interesting is 10 years ago, I would have said that Tower Records like Blockbuster Video would have been too big to fail. And it seems that in talking about its decline, you have to talk about the cultural shift we've seen in the last decade. Like, this is a story that's almost bigger than Tower Records, in a way. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's funny. The, uh, we've been working on this for a few years now, and um, the thing that I think is, is the most difficult to, to, to sort of incorporate into it is, is what, it's, what exactly happened and, and why and, and what is it now. And it's constantly changing. When we started this documentary, Walmart was the number one music retailer, and then it became iTunes, and then it's going to be something else. And it's something, I mean, it's constantly changing so fast now. And I think, you know, in a lot of ways, a lot of people sort of took Tower for granted because it did sort of seem like this too big to fail kind of thing. It was almost the enemy if you were a person who felt you should go to the local record well, store. Well, yeah, and a, lot of, and a lot of people said, like, why on earth would you be celebrating a gigantic corporate, you know, entity that killed mom and pop stores? And, you know, you could make that argument for sure. Um, ironically, I sort of feel like the mom and pop stores, I'm not saying it's easier for them now, but they obviously can still survive a little bit easier now than... Tower, which obviously didn't succeed, you know. Tower, um, I think, uh, you know, the the early history is is really sort of you know, a couple of guys and 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 girls getting together and and being crazy kids and opening up record stores and having a really good time. And by the end, they were far too big and just expanded into countries and cities that they had really no right being in. And 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 that sort of you know. It, that is unfortunate. I mean, in the year 2000, they did a billion dollars in business. That's after Napster had been already out for a few years. And so it wasn't like all of a sudden like the lights went out. It was a, it was a process. And the process was essentially, quite frankly, just that, you know, you could now have the technology to get a bunch of people in a garage and put on a show and put it online. You know, I mean, it's the exact same thing. It's just the technology finally sort of overshot what Tower provided, and um, and it couldn't it couldn't uh, survive on that huge level. It well, we couldn't. we also at some point we might have talked about this in a previous show. Music stopped being an album industry, and with iTunes, it's yeah. more of a singles mm -hmm. industry. And so, really, when you go to these record stores, you really want you find yourself buying <coughs> older. <coughs> Material yeah. back when in the 60s and 70s and 80s and now of course it's iTunes and people download singles for 99 cents yeah. So in a way it's even tougher for these more modern contemporary record stores to survive because it's just not really an album business as much anymore It's funny Russ Solomon has a very interesting theory about that He he actually argues that the sort of the beginning of the fall of the music industry is when they stopped selling singles in record stores Because what they did then is once you stopped selling singles you lost kids coming in and spending a buck two bucks five bucks on a cassette single and once you stopped getting kids into the store, you missed an entire generation of people that were going to grow up 
buying records. And once you do that, then you're kind of screwed. So the idea of like the album as a lost form is totally true, and I think it's very, very valid. But ironically, it's also sort of the entryway. I think that's why you know iTunes worked so well. It's so like, well, now you don't have to pay eighteen ninety five for a whole <clears throat> album that you don't want. Now you can just buy. In fact. Not only can you buy a single, you can choose which single you want to buy, not the, not, not the record label telling you you have to pick this song, this song, or this track you know, of you know, these eight songs. Now you can pick whatever, any, any one you want. Well, you no, know, you know bef music industry when it, in its infancy was about the single. Yeah. It was, they didn't want the album. Yeah, you know, and I think 45s. The, yeah, it was Those 45s, singles, that was yeah. it, and then the flip side, and then the, I guess really because the Beatles, and that's why Sgt. Pepper was so you know, amazingly what it was, because it suddenly became this concept album, and Pet Sounds, and it was like, oh, wait, you can actually do an album, and it doesn't have to be what's the single, Yeah. and now it's come full back around. And now it's come back around, and it is sort of a cyclical thing, you yeah. know, and, and I think that is um, really our, our, our job as, 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 you know, or, or my job as, as the filmmaker is, is that we're, we're just going to try to celebrate the era. And that's, uh, you know, in Sacramento at the store. I mean, I think it was in, this, in the, the, the Kickstarter clip that we put up. But um, uh, the guys that were running the store in Sacramento, they, they put uh, all things must pass, thanks Sacramento. And that, to me, is sort of like the theme of the film, is that nothing lasts forever. You know, it, as simple as that. And, uh, and uh, I think that's a better title than the, what they put up at the, the Sunset Store, which was It's the End of the World as We Know It. That Aww. seemed a little uh, well. It was stupid because stupid. it was obvious and stupid, and because the second, the next line was, "and I feel, feel fine." fine. Sure. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> but you know, when when you do a documentary and you're talking about what the theme of the documentary is, you know, people watch a documentary and there it is, it's all complete after years or whatever it is of filming. The tough part, and you can tell me what it was like for you, is finding that story. Yeah. Okay, Tower Records was was invented and it was great, and now it's dead. What is the story? Like, yeah. What's that through line? Yeah, yeah. Did you find that you had to look for that, or did it sort of come at you, or what is that through line? What's that story? Well, and also, how much cooperation are you getting from them? We're getting full cooperation. I mean, once once uh, Russ got on board, he's been instrumental in sort of pointing us to the people that he really considers vital to the company. And um, in fact, when we got we went up to Sacramento, and and once we sort of got Russ on board, next thing I know, he had a barbecue at his house and invited all of the former employees that still live in Sacramento and we were sort of talking to them all. So we're going to talk to pretty much everyone that we feel is, is very, uh, uh, w that was important in, in, in opening the stores. Um, and, uh, and keep in mind, a lot of these people, uh, by the time Tower closed in 2006, it was the only job that they had ever had. I mean, they started working at Tower when they were 17 and they just never had another job. So um, this is a huge, important part of their lives. When we started the project, like I said, it was just the, the history of it, the beginning, the middle, and the end. And I thought that that would make for an interesting documentary. And then the more and more I talked with them and the more and more documentaries that I watched, I, I realized that you know documentaries can be informative, but they also have to be engaging and entertaining. And the people that worked at Tower are some of the most entertaining and engaging people I've ever met. <laughs> you know, I mean, they, they have terrific stories. They're ton, you know, Tower was that place where if you had a big personality, that was the job that you could, you, you could be at. You didn't have to wear a tie. You could have orange dreadlocks and tattoos. It didn't matter. You could be any kind of person, and that would be the kind of place that you could work at, you know. Um, and so the, 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 the documentary is still continuing to grow and evolve in its own way. And, and as we get more in, into filming more interviews, I'm sure it's going to grow even more in, in that regard. And, but really, the, that's kind of the f fun thing about what we're doing with Kickstarter now is that it's sort of letting everyone into that process and... and and showing everybody what it's like because it's also their movie too, in in a strange way. And how, how did that start? Who was the first person who said, "Hey, let's let's do this"? I did. Kickstarter. I did. Uh, we when we had shot, you know, we had shot a bunch of footage uh, in two thousand eight, and um, we then took that footage out and took a, a whole bunch of meetings to try and secure financing for the film. And uh, it was right when the economy had just completely bombed. And uh, pretty much everyone said, you know, we like the idea. You guys are obviously really passionate, but we don't know who wants to see this movie, A. 
and B, you know, there are a lot of other companies that are going bankrupt right now, you know, why don't you follow that instead of celebrating a company that went bankrupt two years ago? And pretty much everyone we went to was sort of like, we appreciate your chutzpah, but we're not going to be giving you any money. And, um, which was frustrating. And uh, around, uh, probably within the last nine months or so, I ran a, a, a cross Kickstarter. Um, a friend of mine was doing a, a project, a photography project, and he had sent me this link to the Kickstarter, and I looked at it and I sort of said, oh, this is cool. I didn't really know much about it. I'm sort of like you, like the crowdfunding was not a term that I was familiar with. In fact, I was calling it microfinancing for the long time. <laughs> I said, it's, we, we're going to microfinance the film. It's going to be great. Like you're going to buy two goats and use them to make a movie. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> and so, like, uh, essentially, um, I had this conversation with, with, my, uh, with my producing partner. And I said, you know, I think I found a way that we can knock a bunch of birds out with, with one stone. We could make a little money for our film. We can show people the kind of movie that we want to make and we can advertise the film as well and we can find an audience and that audience can join us in trying to make this movie and uh it was it seemed crazy and i was like does that sound like a good idea and he said yeah i think that sounds like a really really great idea and so we went about um you know putting together a, a proper pitch video and coming up with different incentives for people to donate um, we're kind of going into the merchandising business right now, <laughs> trying to come up with t-shirts and stickers and we're going to be printing our own records and DVDs and things like that. But um, it, it ended up sort of being kind of the best way for us to start really re-energizing with this, with this documentary and, and getting it back out there because it, it, it's not only accomplished those things that, that we wanted, but the, the, the things, the offshoots of that that have been really sort of tremendous and inspiring has been not only have we now been put in contact with literally thousands of people that would have taken years to reach out and, and find, um, but by creating this Kickstarter page, Facebook and the Twitter, we now have essentially the whole Tower family, which consists of literally hundreds of thousands of people that worked at Tower Records. And they all are, you know, they're all finding each other online anyways. And so they're finding us and they're getting excited about the movie. They're donating five, 10, 20, you know, sometimes 105 bucks and they're getting involved. And, and the, the, the really exciting thing that is ironic that it, it sort of has come up this way, but by having those people involved in the movie, in a sense, is sort of creating that same sort of atmosphere and environment that every single Tower Records had. It's giving them a sense of ownership in the film because it's there. It's something that they want to know about. It's something they want to hear about, and we want to try and tell the story as, as best as we can. So, it's sort of this group mentality that um, is very, very strong amongst uh, Tower employees and just music fans in general. You know, it sounds like a documentary that I'd seen. Uh, in Cannes in 2000, I think it was four, called Z Channel, Magnificent Obsession. Oh, yeah. yeah, I remember that one. And it's Zoe Cassavetes directed yeah. it. It's a terrific documentary. And it reminds me of that because it's a, it's a company that was founded by one visionary guy mm -hmm. creating a community of, in this case, music, uh, movie lovers. Mm -hmm. And it sort of took on its own little personality. Yeah. And the people who loved it became a community of people who loved it. And the, the visionary behind it he had his own problems, personal problems, career problems, and it just really drove that story. And this very much reminds me of Z Channel. Yeah, <coughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, it's very common sort of thing. I mean, Russ is an uh, was and and still is uh, an, an entrepreneur. You know, he's a, he's a smart guy, and um, he was constantly sort of hustling and constantly trying to find out you know, the best way for, for him to make a buck. And I don't mean that in a, in a negative sense. I mean that in a sort of, you know, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to sell records. He wanted to make money. He wanted to have a good time. He, he wanted all of those sorts of things. 
And um, that spirit that he had, that a lot of other people had, uh, a lot of other people had, um, as I'm sure some of the people here in this room have, doing this show the way the, the way that it's being done. Um, that sort of sense of like, well, we'll just do it. We'll figure it out. We'll we'll find a way to do it because we love it. We don't care if we're paid. <laughs> what are you saying, that. Colin? Hines? I don't know they about get, that. They get pizza. But uh, they Ooh. did. They did get pizza. Uh, I got pizza too. Yeah, yeah. I got paid. Um, <laughs> but um, that sort of sense of like, you know, let's just try and have a lot of fun and hopefully, you know, hopefully make some money in the process. And and it just went so much farther than you would have possibly imagined. I mean, they it started in Sacramento with in the drugstore, and then they opened up a proper store and then that did well enough to open up another store and then that did well enough to do another store and then they said well let's do something really crazy and open up a store in San Francisco and then that did really well because it just so happened to coincide with the summer of love when that city was invaded by a hundred thousand hippies and then that was a raging success and then they said well then maybe we can try opening up a store in Los Angeles so let's build a store in Los Angeles and it just will so happen to be on the Sunset Strip and that will just so happen to become this iconic building this mecca for kids and this mecca for the music industry that was all coming up in Los Angeles and then instead of going then from New York you know or going to New York or Nashville or any of these places they went to Japan not because they wanted to, but because some other kid who had was from Japan and was going to school in the States uh, loved Tower and thought that he could open up his own Tower in New York or in 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 Japan without telling anyone from the Tower in the States. <laughs> and so some record buyer who Russ knows, who was going through Japan selling records, um, said, "Hey." Uh, you might want to go to Japan because there's this kid who's trying to open up tower stores. And that's how they opened up tower records in Japan. You know, it's so like, there, was, there, there, there was no lawsuit. It was just there was no lawsuit. No, he, they, they was worked there it out. Fighting? They ended up working out. They, they did some kung fu fighting, but they solved it. Wow. Um, and uh, it's like those little sorts of things, you know, it is true. Like, I'm sure Blockbuster has a similar story. You know, I know Nike has a similar story to that, but it, it's... With Tower, there are just all of these great personalities in this history that I just think when you when you look at it in in in, in the perspective of well, these are just some guys from Sacramento who are selling records, and it turned yeah. into Tower Records. I think it's really sort of astounding and and really fun. A couple well, of questions from the chat room. Oh, Ooh, yes. chat room. Uh, Beatmaster eighty wants to know top three music movies. Are you a big Top three oh. movies about Step music. up three D. Ste yeah. Step up three D. Hey. Could that be all three? Because it's in <laughs> yeah. three dimensions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah. three. You could it's just say three. Step Ups one two. Step up to the streets. Mm -hmm. Step up. Do you have three. any favorite? Do you have any favorite <laughs> mo movies? Uh, Does that influence you, you when you're making this? Uh, your love of music. Uh, no, no, not too much. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much into any, you know, high fidelity is definitely uh, high on that list. It has to be. It has to be high on that list. Um, what's some other ones? I don't know. Empire yeah. Records? I wasn't a huge Empire Records movie. Idolmaker's my favorite. Say which one? Idolmaker. You know what? Idolmaker's great. American Hot Wax is great. American Hot Wax, yeah. That's a good one too, right? Yeah. Walk Hard. Right. Walk Hard? The walk, Dewey walk Hard's funny. The, yeah. do, walk the Dewey Cox right? story? Yeah. That's you're you're good with the semicolon. Well, Beat Master who asked was very happy with High Fidelity. That's a good one. <laughs> they, 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 they liked Apparently your answer. That was the right answer. That was the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> then, you know, they were testing you. But then, you know, sometimes the documentaries are better. Sometimes the documentaries... Do you have, are you a big doc guy? Do you, is this I why, am, uh, yeah. I'm, what's I'm, your, what do you think is a very well done doc? That when you're doing this, that you are thinking about... How, man, I uh, hope this to, is as good as. Oh well, no, I don't want to. I don't want to break my that. brain like that right. just yet. No. <laughs> I don't the do film from the fury. That's a good one. That's yeah. a good one, right? That's a very good um, one. I guess talk a little bit about how people can help this, how they can fund it, how can they be part of this. Yeah. So this is where I can go. All right. Hey, yes. everybody. How's Sell it. Going? Uh, no, uh, what you can do is you can go on to kickstarter.com and you can do uh, just a keyword search for Tower Records will come up. The film is called All Things Must Pass, The Rise and Fall of Tower Records. And you can go on our page, you can uh, see our little pitch video. And uh, once you're done with that, we have a little bit of a written sort of statement of what we want the movie to be. Um, which sort of reiterates what we talked about in the video. And then uh, you'll see a bunch of different sort of incentives and uh, the incentives sort of work. If you have $5, you get a sticker, $10, you can get 
a t-shirt, uh, $15 for posters, and it can go all the way up to, you know, if you really have $2,000 to spend and you want to come to a private screening that I'll host, you can do that. Um, and essentially, uh, you become a backer of the film and you sort of uh, get uh, updates from us as we make the film, as things progress. And um, you sort of become uh, a part of uh, the, the team, so to speak. We've already raised, our initial goal was uh, $50,000. You have to set a goal, and then if you reach that goal, you then are able to collect the money. If you don't reach that goal, you do not collect the money. We were very fortunate, and we raised $50,000 in five days, which wow. was great. Nice. Right. And I'm very, very uh, thankful to everyone who has already uh, contributed. But um, fundraising is not done. It is not over. The more money that we raise, the more money we have to make our film. So the more money we have, the better the film will be. <laughs> uh, and uh, a majority of the funds will go towards essentially the small nuts and bolts of the filmmaking, uh, buying like lighting packages. Uh, we have to travel to places like Sacramento and uh, New York. I'm hoping to get to Japan because there's a, a big group of people in Japan that I'd like to interview. Um, and so we're just asking for uh, for for help. Essentially. Awesome. And so for just please. five dollars, you can get your name in the credits. Yeah, and uh, at every at every level of donations, you get your name in the credits, and you can donate money and have someone else's name in if you want. Like you I can. could give this to Mark for his birthday. Yes, there you could. You go. Just spell my name right, please. You could. <laughs> Nobody ever told me. That's fine. Yeah. I, I don't know how, but I'll make sure that it's done <laughs> that is, correctly. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, and then other than this, uh, something you can't talk about, Dexter. Dexter. <laughs> we, do, we do a show here called Stupid for Dexter as well. <laughs> yes. And you can tell us what about it. Uh, as with all things with the Dexter television program, I can neither confirm nor deny anything there about my involvement in the Dexter television program. Awesome. And when you can, we hope to have you on. I am in it, though. Yes. That there much is true. That you can say. There I'm in 12 go. episodes. So, 12 Woo! episodes. Get ready for that, and we're that, hoping that's that the... That's the weekly uh, paycheck we're talking about. It's exactly, get in there, get it done. Going. Exactly yeah. like good guys. You got more... Oh. Oh. And, and the 12th episode will wrap this place in plastic and bring you in. I really don't want to be it's in creepy. this place. And, oh, yeah, it's I creepy. Know. We'll show you the beginning. When they, where there are <laughs> cats, cats on the Dexter table. It's very creepy. It's not the plastic that makes this place creepy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's Corey, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, Actually, I really want Chad Vader back. Yeah, he's great. <laughs> he's, he's, he's every week. He's Is a regular. he yeah. every week? He's our news guy. He's what a great guy. He's very funny. <laughs> I like Chad Vader. You, would you like to maybe do a show with Chad Vader? We we can we can make that happen as yeah. well. Yeah. Well, you want know no, what? Let's wait until no Free money. Willy Five comes out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll do Free Willy Five. You and Chad Vader, adventures. It would be great. You have no idea how hard it was to sit here while you guys are reviewing movies and be like. Oh, I want to say something about this movie. Yes, oh, you could. Oh, I wanted to yes, yeah. oh, you could totally yell out. I didn't want to do oh, that. Oh, we should have gave you a mic. Oh, you should have done it. We should have gave you a mic. Mm -hmm. you gave you I mic. can do it all right now. Yeah. Go. Go through it real fast. It the Chinese aren't going to care about the Green Lantern movie because they have green paper lanterns all over the country. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was in the best. Super good. 8 uh, is essentially, when you really think about it, uh, Steven Spielberg's Wet Dreams, so J.J. Abrams is incredibly smart to just go, I'm going to make the movie that Steven Spielberg wants me to make and wants to see. So you could say, in other words, that it's Spielberg porn. I wouldn't go that far because that has a different connotation, but it involves everything that he loves. Children, and I mean that in a very sensitive, normal way, <laughs> filmmaking and monsters. Um, Conan O'Brien's really, really funny, and that's a good documentary. I'm looking forward to seeing it. And, um, and I have a feeling, regardless of what you say, if Dennis Dugan had directed Super 8, you would have liked the film. <laughs> it would have been a totally different film. It would have been a totally different film. Because it would have sucked, as opposed to the one that J.J. Abrams did. There'd be a lot more people that's tripping good. and falling, but that's He's fine. He's the worst. Have you, have you worked with Dennis Dugan, be honest? I have not worked with him, but I know him. Really? Oh, yeah. Mark. I'm just good. saying. Uh, so this is all very strange for me because I like know so yeah, many yeah, people. Yeah, sure. No, no, it it's is. the same with us. We, yeah, it's what it's he's really strange. Like, we kind of know that. Have you ever seen, uh, 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 this is true, I've never felt like less of a man that when I happened to walk into a room that also contained Ryan Reynolds. 
<laughs> he just has that yeah. aura. He, but he's, he's, he's actually he's very nice. I'm not nice. saying that he's, smug, you know, he's cold dreamy. fish thing that you were saying earlier, but he's... Yeah, he's, he's a guy. Well, it's, it's, he's a man. It's like a John Hamm thing. He's a man. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's even more of a man than John Hamm. I'm not on Team Hamm. Hmm. Really? There's something Team about Hamm? Reynolds. Too, too dark on the five o'clock shadow? Yeah. Team Hamm is just too weaselly for me. There's something about the face. No, but, it, but in real life, John, John Hamm in real life oh, is just a quiet guy who likes to go and watch comedy. Yeah, he like puts yeah. his he puts his St. Louis blues hat on. He kind of hides. He puts on glasses and he goes to like UCB and watches. Well, you've added him now. I know I've added him. Yeah, but he loves John. Oh, guys, we're kidding. He's a, a he's Nashville a, Predators he's a, fan. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah he's not. <laughs> you see a St. Louis blues hat? That's not him. It's not. It's not him. That's Bob Ham. Yeah, that's Bob. Um, well, with that, I think, uh, you know, anytime you want to come in to review movies, you're more than welcome to. Yeah. <laughs> so All right. As long as they involve people you don't know. That's well, people you want to work with. Yes. That's, that's the problem. That's the problem. Okay, that's the number one problem. person you want to work with, go. Number one person you're like, I got to work with that guy. Director and actor, go. Oh, uh, that's easy. Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> 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 and Dennis Dugan. <laughs> this interview is over. All right, you know what it's time for? It's over. Fire rents are burned, folks! <laughs> By the way, will you guys, you got to go on the Kickstarter and support Colin's film. This film sounds fantastic. Thank you, guys. You, know, you can come invest on, guys. as little as a dollar. You can invest as little as a dollar. One yes, dollar. That's why we brought him in. Okay. I mean, we're we try to we're trying to do more. People have asked about independent movies, and that's why we brought Colin in. We're bringing in the guy who did, uh, you know, Conan, Conan O'Brien last week, and then uh, possibly dying to do Letterman. A few of my friends did that. Hopefully, will come up soon too. We're trying to get some more independent filmmakers in here because none of us are big fans of the huge studio system. Everybody wants to see very smartly done, well done movies, and that comes from independent filmmakers like Colin. That is true. Yeah, we're trying, we're trying something new. Yes, that's right. All right, so buy, rent, or burn. Now, uh, uh, for the uninitiated, yeah. Mike, how does buy, rent, or burn work? Buy, rent, or burn works that uh, on Facebook you list a movie, and then uh, people like it, and the one with the most likes, we then ask these guys over here if they should buy it, rent it, or burn it. And by burn it, we mean in a fire. In a fire. All right, uh, so here it goes by likes. I'm actually going to start with that one. I don't know if you have the right order. I know it's the wrong order. Okay, with 13 people liking, and we put this at the bottom, Elaine smartly did, but all right, I got to go by the rules, and the rules is the number one liked one, with 13 likes on Facebook.com slash Stupid for Movies, from Matt Wright, The Human Centipede. Did we talk about this a yeah, couple weeks just, ago? Did. We didn't buy, run, or burn it, though. Huh? Did we buy, run, or burn it? It's, it's, it's below burn. I know. So burn it. Do we we mean literally, this one, I think we're all in Yeah, actually, yeah. You actually burn, burn it. it. Like throw it in the fire. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, wait, it, there, it, is, there is worse than buy, run, or burn. Worse than buy, run, or burn. There's there is a something worse. Of acid? What we do is we, we take no, the no. worst movie acid? of the year and we say it's lower than, which is Sucker Punch right now, is what we've decided. It's, it's the worst film of the year. So, so I you, say Sucker Punch that thing. So we Sucker Punch it. Oh, oh, yeah. It's got the whole thing going on. Okay. Now we're going to go to that one. You're trying to kill me. No. With 10 people liking from Lance Taylor asks about Jurassic Park. First of all, Lance Taylor is a longtime uh, listener of the DigiGods podcast that Wade and I record for IGN.com. So, hello, Lance Taylor. Woo! Thank you for uh, watching. Jurassic, Jurassic Park. I mean, you got to buy that. It's Jurassic Park. Dinosaurs. Rawr. Bye. Objects and mirror are closer than they appear. That great shot bye. in the thing. <laughs> 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 Everybody <laughs> saying bye. Historical context now. Okay, okay. You gotta buy. For Thank historical you. context, fine. I was yeah. going to say rent just because everybody's seen it ten times. So you really need to own That's it. It's still a good movie. It is still a good movie. And you know what? Those dinosaurs look better today than almost anything in The Green Lantern. You know, I, uh, it's true. That is totally true. It the is Green Lantern is like watching just, it's like watching Halo. It is, I still think that CGI topped off at Terminator 2. Like watching two. your roommate play. <laughs> hey, hey, play Halo. <laughs> it's even worse. It's not even playing. It's Go awesome. that way. Oh, he's not going that way. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't get the power up. Got power, power up. All right. Eight Shoot people. the gun that spreads. <laughs> <laughs> Eight people liking Wes Yunker's pick of That's Punch a lot of people. Drunk. Yeah, We're talking really. 15, 15 people like this movie. Eight. Well, they, Eight. you know, it's like, well, it's spread out. There was like okay. 60 people recommended and their friends uh, okay. come. So it's all spread. We, we did like Punch 10. Drunk Love. I think we did that the last show. Did we do Punch Drunk yes, Love? Yes, I said. Wes does not pay attention I, to the show. I am, I. Uh, well, there's new people. P Punch P Drunk Love. P.T. Anderson. I'm burning I, it. I, I bow down yeah. to P.T. Yeah. Anderson. You can do no wrong. Oh, wait, what's Amy saying? I'm burning it. This is the most misogynistic film I've ever seen. What? Yeah. The female wow. is not a character. The love story is ridiculous. It's only just wow. 
A guy's fantasy about being a misunderstood bully, but somehow will find an amazing girlfriend. See also okay. Sideways. I okay. hate this genre of film. As opposed to Green Lantern. Now, here's the thing with Green Lantern. <laughs> Angela, <laughs> You're never uh, this one down. Angela never Bassett going. is in Green Lantern, right? The only African-American character in the whole film, right? She's mm -hmm. in the movie for three seconds with a horrible uh, a wig. And there's a scene where you flash back onto her, onto her past, right? Remember that when he touches mm -hmm. her and flash back? Mm -hmm. It was the most cliched, insulting past that you can give an African-American character. She lives in the projects and her family died in a gang shoot. And you're like, that's so, that's like insulting. She doesn't live in the projects. Yeah, there, 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 was, a, there was a shot of the Cabrini Green. Uh, it's uh, a Cabrini signing. Green. Colin, what do yes. you say about Punch Drunk Love? Uh... Uh, is that where we were? Yeah, that yeah, Pirate or Bird. Yeah. That's what I don't know where the Green Lantern thing came. I don't know either. That's why I'm trying to move on from them. <laughs> I think he was like he's got some childhood issues yeah. with old <laughs> with Green, Green Lantern. I think he's got some camping, adult little camping issues. problems. Maybe uh, I re I only saw the movie once. I remember actually not liking it that much. <gasps> Um, I would say that it's due for a reviewing, so I would rent. All right. <laughs> oh, I like the justification, the reviewing yeah, justification. All right, let's move that. on. Uh, with seven people liking, Crisette Loretta asks about Daydream Nation. What? Daydream Nation. Daydream, Daydream Nation. Nation. I remember that film. That was, was, is that the... I don't know this I don't know. Daydream Nation. Who directed that? Somebody? I don't know. I'm to be it. <laughs> my, my I, I'm going down. to rent it. Internet show, <laughs> and he just said my internet is down. Oh. <laughs> awesome. God, that sounds familiar. What is that? Somebody help me out. Daydream, Daydream Nation, Nation is, is Michael it? Goldback. Documentary, right? Tells the story of a city girl who moves to a small town and becomes entangled in a love triangle. <laughs> that reminds me a lot of the Green Lantern. You know, <laughs> can I tell another story about the Green Lantern? It's very no. funny. Wow. All right, so moving on. You so don't know. On. Great. Uh, well, I think we're all in agreement that we're going to rent it so we can find out what it is. Great. Yes. There you go. Let's oh, rent the information uh, to find out to what the back. heck it good is. justification. It That's good. Bring it back. We're going to rent. There you go. Yay! <laughs> Axel Pironio <laughs> on Facebook asks about Grave of the Fireflies. It's an anime. Yeah, you know what? Cat knows a cat. I know. It's all that uh, Japanese. Oh, Cat wants me to say bye to the Japanese anime Grave of the Fireflies. Sure. Is that, yeah. is that a good one? It is sad. It's so sad. That's, it's a sad it anime. No, it's good. Oh, All right, really? Mark says bye. Well, you know if you like anime? that kind of stuff, I, I need to ask the expert a question. Is there tentacle porn? Uh -huh. <laughs> oh. Well, in that case, burn it. Burn. Not this one. Burn. I'm done. In the sequel. No, Colin, do you like the anime? Uh, I'm not a necessarily a big anime yeah. dude. Me neither. So, uh, yeah, buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I got the that money. makes no sense at all. <laughs> I, got the money. I love it. What? Uh, I'm uh, buying it in the six dollar bin. So. There you go. There it is. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's go to Christina Young. Asks about the Goonies. The, uh, Bye. Uh, well, the, the you know because we talked about Super Eight. That's one of the films that JJ is sort right. of uh, you know paying homage to. Is the Goonies, which is great. It's a good movie. Buy it. Buy it. Colin says buy it. Buy I say it. buy it. Amy, what do you say? I'm going to do everybody a favor and say you should burn it because if you watch it again as an adult, you're going to be reminded that it's not as good as you think it was. Back here you again. don't. Corey just kicked you out. I just got kicked out? <laughs> you guys don't. If, if the movie is this beautiful thing in your memory, let it stay that way. You know way. what I'm going to say? I've never seen The Goonies. <gasps> I didn't have a childhood. Never come back. I think I saw the Tin Drum when I was a kid. That's my childhood. The Tin Drum. Oh, wow. Geez. Yeah, I, was, I didn't really have a childhood. Thing. And Luna. That took away your childhood. I was always like, I am dark. That took away your childhood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. I'm going to jump down the stairs and never grow. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> weird movie if you haven't seen it. No, weird Goonies movie. is a good movie. It is I would Goonies, like to yeah. see. I would like to know what an eight-year-old thinks of Goonies now. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. That's what I would like to know. I will. I'll, so I almost think you have to like sort of phrase, yeah. would you... Buy, rent, or burn for an eight-year-old. Oh, we kid. have a, we have a thing called oh, parental guidance. Parental maybe you guidance. can do that instead, and maybe you do movies like that, that instead of free willy. Is that where the free willy? Yeah, maybe you can come in and do Goonies. You have children, right? I don't know. Yeah, I don't yeah. have. I do have children. <laughs> I don't know if I have children. <laughs> he's been there. He's been there this long. He's not sure I'm anymore saying, where he is. I'm just saying I don't know. But then you know, if it gets me onto the show quicker, then yeah, I'll do the parental <laughs> guidance. <laughs> <thing. laughs> We're gonna, yeah, this is gonna be the longest show by far. Holy Love it. All right, here we go. Let's Holy go. Here we go. Cow. Three, two, one, roll. All right, let's go to the Ustream chat. Let's go to Rami Alam, who's, whose course is in Egypt. Hi, um, Rami. Always here every week. I think it's like 6 a.m. in Egypt. What are you doing? Uh, Vampire's Kiss. Vampire's Kiss. 
Isn't that Nicholas Cage? Nicholas Cage. Cage. Cage thing. Oh, no, no, no. Not well, the one well, where he's <laughs> full of beef. No, 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 no. <laughs> that, that's the Wicker Man. No, vampires. The, Wicker they, man. They, 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 the look. one where he's screaming about toast. The, Why did it burn? Yeah. Why did it burn? <laughs> <laughs> there is no such thing as a good Nicholas Cage film at this point. The last good Nicholas Cage film that I would recommend would be The Weatherman, the Gore Verbinski film, which okay. I liked a lot. I like Leaving Las Vegas. Well, that was before, well, but well, the well. Weatherman was in two thousand six. So we're saying, saying you're not, not saying even Bad Lieutenant Two. Bad Lieutenant Two is fantastic. I didn't like that movie. Are you saying Burn? Burn, Burn, Vampire's Kiss. You guys know opinion? Oh, Brad Pitt. Did we need a cockroach in that movie? Or Again, I, I'll yeah. buy it. Oh, this he was is a method cockroach, cockroach eater in that movie. Oh, oh, here we go. That's Let's try to do two more here. You stream chat. Shut up. May asks about ten things I hate about you. I'm not gonna. <laughs> this is young Heath Ledger. This is this is Heath Ledger with wet curly. That's what killed him, by hair. the way. Big in movies, that bad. Oh my god. Oh, oh, god. That's right. Wow. Go wow. cut that out into a YouTube YouTube Again, video. We'll get so dozens I was, of people watching. Are you serious? You just know. made that joke? Used to know or Yes I did. Wow. Just burn it! Come on, who it's terrible! No. Uh, Julia Stiles. Julia Stiles, Julia Stiles, Stiles was in that. Terrible. David Crumholtz was in that. Julia movie. Stiles, who also yeah. Dexter season five. Joseph yeah. Gordon Levitt. Yeah, yeah. Was I, in that I, movie. I oh, you're saying right. rent, buy? You don't care. I'm gonna buy it. I was <laughs> in movies like those, they're all interchangeable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's go for YouTube chat. Let's go for Dream of Fallen One asked about Long Hot Summer from 1958. Is that better? Is that is that the uh, is is that the film noir long hot Elaine summer? Like noir, well, you're the Elaine only one who was know. alive back then, so why don't you tell us? Oh, that's an outrage. I was, was five. It? No, no, no. Yeah. Man, long hot summer. Twenty-seven. <laughs> wow, they're picking one. It's all coming together. It's a Paul huh? Newman movie, Joanne Woodward. Oh, that's right. Very good. Buy it. That was buy it, buy that it. was Francis. Anthony Francioso. Yeah, yeah. It's got Paul Newman good. in it. Buy it. It's good. Yep. Especially right, gotta back buy. then. Gotta buy. Especially Be back ramming. then. We've gotta buy. Let's Go. do one Let's more. Let's do one more. Let's do six. Nick more. Money, Grandma's good. Boy. Last one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that is. I know. Why I, are people picking I bad know. movies? You're killing me, people. <laughs> I know that movie. <laughs> well, why don't you tell us about it? Uh, Nick Swartzen's in it, and uh, uh, Alan Covert. All right. And it was oh. uh, not directed by Dennis Dugan. I will never live that down. It was directed by uh, Nicholas Goosen. And, uh, yeah, I read it. It's a funny Where little movie. Where you want it? Where you read it? Is this one I he remember he falls it. in love with his grandma? Uh, yeah. No, he, it's, uh, he moves in he's with, living his, with his, grandma. his grandma. Yeah, yeah he's living, living with his grandma. And he's okay. like a video game tester. Oh. Linda Cardellini is in it. Ah. Hmm. Um, as much as I hate, love I, I hate to contradict Colin Hanks, but I have to say burn it. I say rent anything with Linda Cardellini. <laughs> Smart man. Thing to live Smart man. <laughs> All right, so that's Fire Richard Burn, folks, with special guest Colin Hanks. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> All right, six hours later, we're wrapping it up. What? What are we going to talk about in the second half of the show? <laughs> the Green Lantern. More about the Green Lantern. Okay, here's what we learned. What we learned is uh, uh, we learned nothing except that Colin Hanks has a documentary that you guys got to go to Kickstarter to support. Kickstarter.com, uh, keyword search, Tower Records. All things must pass. And then the while you're there, we may be up on Kickstarter by that point, you too. So feel free to give well. us a little as well. That's true. There it is. Yeah. All right, folks. Thank you to Amy Nicholson. Thank you, Thank you. She was fantastic. Thank you to Colin Hanks. Thank you to the best crew in the internet world. We'll be back in two weeks, folks. We'll see you tonight.